Dear viewers, welcome to yet another episode of Expert Speaks. This is the tax filing season, 31st July 2024. The last day to file the tax return is just a few days old. NRA community has a couple of doubts in their mind. Should I file my tax returns or not? Under what conditions should I file my tax returns? To simplify on this matter and to take you through a checklist of things to look at, I have invited today expert of the week, chartered accountant, Sanket Naik for this episode. Stay till the end of this video. Many final points are going to be discussed during the course of this conversation. This is NRA Money Clinic for you and I am Dr. Chandra Kahabat, your financial guide for a happy living. NRI Money Clinic. No hype, just the right advice. Dear viewers, to help you with deciding should you be filing the tax returns as an NRA or not, I have invited for this conversation today popular chartered accountant in Bangalore, C.A. Sanket Naik. C.A. Sanket Naik is young, dynamic, intelligent, popular in Bangalore and has built a nice practice within a short span of just a decade. He is assisted by his wife, Pratiksha Pai, again a chartered accountant, and she runs a YouTube channel by name intelligent investor which discusses topics of taxation and finance. Do subscribe to their channel and be guided on the various topics they always address the audience with. Sanket Naik, apart from being a practicing chartered accountant, also has a certificate of CPA, a Unified Certified Public Accountant of USA. He has helped a lot of NRIs in filing the tax return, helping them with the notices, and various aspects which specialize for the NRA community. Welcome to this episode, C.A. Sanket Naik. Thank you, Dr. Bhatt, for having me over. And uh, it's my pleasure to answer any questions. Uh, Sanket, NRA community has lots of doubt. The doubt is that, should I file my tax returns or not? When should I file my tax returns? These are the dilemmas which are there in the minds of NRA community. Let me ask the doubts that they have. They have shown all these doubts to me through the comment section and direct message to me as well. I'll ask you one by one questions now. Kindly help me with the answers from your practice. First question is, which NRI should file tax returns? Yes, that is a very uh, simple or maybe sometimes even a very complicated question as well. But one of the very basic conditions which we need to fulfill is that if the incomes of that NRI is crossing the basic exemption limit in India, then he has to file his tax returns. Now, in India currently, if you are under the old regime, it stands at 2.5 lakhs and under the new regime, it stands at 3 lakhs. But there are certain exceptions here. The exceptions being that if there are any dividend incomes or any incomes under short-term or long-term capital gain which are enjoying a special rate of tax, then the basic exemption limit doesn't count in such cases. Mr. Sanket Naik, I understood this point that if when somebody has an income which is higher than the threshold limit of basic tax exemption, he needs to file the tax rate. But in real life, there can be cases where he doesn't have the income which is higher than the threshold level. But there could be circumstances where he has to still file the tax return without even having this basic uh, uh, income in India. Can you elaborate on uh, such situations which necessitate a uh, filing of tax returns? As I said earlier, this is the uh, basic exemption limit is one of the basic conditions. However, there are other conditions as well, wherein you may need to file your tax returns, even though your income may not cross the basic exemption limit. One such case is where there are transactions in your bank accounts, deposits in your bank accounts, for 50 lakhs or more in one or more bank accounts in the financial year, then you'll still be required to file your tax returns even though you may not have any income in India. One more aspect wherein this can arise is let's say you have a TDS or TCS of 25,000 or more in a financial year. Then in that case as well, you would be required to file your tax returns even though you may not have income crossing the basic exemption limit. Now one more point to be noted is in regard to the basic exemption limit, how is this to be calculated? Is this before or after the deductions? Now, what we have to check is this is to be checked before deductions. So before you take any chapter 6a deductions, that is ATC, ATD and so on, 
or let's say you have any capital gain related reinvestment like under 54 or 54F, then uh, basic exemption limit should be considered prior to taking these deductions. Uh, Mr. Sanket Nai, one of the misconceptions that is there in the minds of NRICs, they get into some financial transaction. As law mandates, a TDS will happen. It could be property transaction, it could be the interest from the NRO account, it could be some other purchase or whatever. The belief or the assumption that is there in the mind of NRI is, once the TDS is done, that is the tax that I am supposed to pay and I don't need to do anything. Is this belief correct? If not, what is the right thing and what is the thing that the NRA should keep in mind when the TDS is done? What is his responsibility beyond this point? Yes, that's a very uh, good question. So many uh, many NRIs are under this assumption, but that is not right. TDS is just a deduction of taxes which happens from your income or your transaction. However, your obligation only comes to a close once you file the tax return. And once you file the tax return, you have to declare your due income, which may be lesser than the amounts for which TDS has been deducted. And you're eligible to claim a refund as well in case your tax payable is lesser than the amount for which TDS is deducted. Once you file your tax return and did get it verified, then your obligation comes to an end as far as filing of the tax return is concerned. TDS is just the initial step and TDS does not ensure that your obligations of filing returns comes to a close. So is it fair to say that TDS is a preventive taxation? It identifies that there is a transaction which you have done. The taxes that you have paid could be something which you need not have paid. Or on the contrary, it could be that you still have to pay much higher than that particular amount which is done as a TDS. So when a TDS is done, when it crosses a certain thresh threshold, then an NRA has to file the tax return. You can claim the TDS or you may have to pay extra amount of tax in case if you are liable to pay. Is my understanding correct? Yes, you are right. So TDS in many cases, in most cases, in fact, for NRAs, because uh, normally they are prescribed a higher rate of TDS, they would already be deducted at a higher rate. But in due to ignorance or for whatever reason, if a person hasn't deducted TDS for a transaction with NRA, it is possible that his tax obligation may be higher than the TDS as well. So in such situations, if there are certain incomes which have not suffered any TDS, then he may have to pay taxes on that over and above the TDS which is already deducted from him. I understood this TDS concept pretty well. There is another terminology, TCS. When people buy certain assets, uh, the TCS happens. Uh, NRIs come and buy a vehicle here, they leave a vehicle here, TCS happens. Is TCS also the tax payable? What is the obligation on the part of an NRI when a TCS is done? There is a mis common misconception that TCS is an additional tax which is to be paid. This is not true. But TCS is something very similar to TDS. It is just a collection of tax which happens so that these high value transactions can be detected by the income tax department and you are eligible to claim the credit for these TCS similar to TDS at the time of filing of your tax returns. There is no obligation as such in the NRI's end. The TCS will be done by the other party, example the automobile dealer in case of a car, but claim this TCS while he is filing his tax returns. NRIs have another query. This is with respect to ADA. We have two sets of NRIs. NRIs who have not come to India, they don't have an ADA. There is another set of NRIs who have got an ADA before they become an NRI or they have got ADA subsequently. If somebody has an ADA or if he doesn't have an ADA, what are the things that the NRIs need to be doing now? In the last one or two years, this has become a very hot topic because the PANs became inoperative wherever ADAs were not there. So basically, if an NRI doesn't possess an Aadhaar, he is not under any obligation to apply for an Aadhaar. As long as he's a non-resident, there is an exemption from applying for an Aadhaar. So as a result, non-residents who have never come to India in the last several years or decades, or who do come in but have not applied for an Aadhaar, have no obligation as long as they're non-residents. Now let's say in another scenario, people who had already applied for an Aadhaar when they were residents, or either when they are non-residents and they are still applied for it. Now, what happens in such situations? This is a grey area as such, but it is advisable that in such cases, you can go for linking your PAN and Aadhaar because the notification which was there in relation to PAN and Aadhaar gave an exemption for 
those NRAs who did not possess an other. So as a result, if you're already having it, it is advisable to link it with your pen. One another problem the NRAs face is that I do not get uh, notices. My email ID, which I had uh, put it in the IT portal, is no more functional. I have forgotten about it. The email ID, what I use today, uh, by default is different. My address is a old one. Things have changed over a period of time. What is the obligation and what NRS can do to remain well informed about the notices or anything that is being sent from the IT department? Yes, this is very important today because in today's day, most of the notices are coming through email and very few cases where physical notices are being sent. So what happens is in many occasions, the NRIs would have put up their older email ID or sometimes their work email ID or sometimes the tax consultant may have put his email ID by the time of registration in the income tax portal. So it is always advisable that you always update your email ID if you have not already done so or at least keep checking this at the time of filing your tax returns because any notices would be visible on the income tax portal when you log in to file your tax return. It is very much visible over there. Additionally, uh, update your email ID, update your addresses so that any communications which do come, you will be uh, updated about it. And we have seen in many cases that some NRIs have got notices which they never received but has been sent by the department. And after multiple times, they even got uh, final demand orders running into several lakhs together. Sanket, uh, there is a section of NRIs who live in remote areas like in African desert. There are people who are working in the oil fields of northern Russia. Uh, there are places where they are not accessible. Sometimes their working conditions require that they get dissociated from their mobile phones when they are on duty. For weeks together, they are not available to answer, reply. So this is a practical issue. There are people who are working as a seafarers who don't have a connectivity. Uh, one of the questions that has been thrown at me to answer is, instead of I attending to all these things, can I give a power of attorney? If yes, who can be entrusted with that responsibility? What answers you have for this question raised by the NRA government? So it's a very good uh, suggestion because in many cases, uh, there are certain situations wherein some physical signatures may also be required. Let's say there are some notices which arise and there are certain appeals to be filed or certain uh, communications to be made to the tax officer, or sometimes you may need to authorize a representative to the uh, representative before the income tax department, like a chartered accountant or a tax advocate. In such situations, it may be difficult for the NRA to sign off on any documents. Or sometimes, like you said, in their remote locations, it may not be possible to communicate with them. So it is advisable to give a general power of attorney to any immediate relative, or if the general power of attorney is uh, something which is difficult, it is understandable, uh, then you can always give a special power of attorney as well to an immediate relative or any friend for the specific purpose of filing the tax returns or signing off on any documents in relation to the tax returns or appointing any representative to appear on behalf of that SSC so that there is no such issue at the time of uh, any notices being received and there is a time gap because of the remote issues. Thank you for that uh, answer. One another practical issue faced by NRIs or ignorance, you can say, is that they channelized a lot of funds into their NRE and NRO. Now, when you dig into the source of these funds, it could be somebody's employer who is remitting their salary directly into their NRA. It happens in many a times in cases of seafarers. It happens in case of people who are working in Bangladesh, uh, people who are working in certain African countries. So this situation is very rare. So these employees themselves ask their employers to remit money directly to their NRE account instead of taking into their bank account outside of India. And these people are under the impression that any money which comes from abroad into their NRE and NRO account is tax-free in India. What does the law say? What that as a qualified chartered accountant, you have to save for the NRA community, which is into this bank. So normally what happens is the concept of taxation in India, it considers a few aspects. One is whether the income is received in India or whether the income is accrued in India. Now, in case the money is received in the Indian bank account directly 
from the employer or from any other source then in that case it becomes income received in india and such an income can be taxable in india even for non residents now what happens is is all are all monies received in the nre or nro account taxable no in case you have received the money in a foreign bank account in your foreign bank account and then you remit it to india such incomes will not be subject to tax because that is just a remittance done out of your income received abroad however if you directly receive the foreign incomes in your indian bank account then that can be subject to tax in india there are certain exemptions available but in most cases it is not advisable and you may end up paying taxes in india for such transactions so it is better to say that as a housekeeping rule to the extent possible wherever it is possible better receive these amounts in your foreign banks and you transmit this money from your foreign bank account into your nre or nro account as the case may be that is a better way of staying away from the notices from uh, income tax department good practice to follow yes that's right it's a very good practice to follow because in that case that is not going to be income received in india it is just going to be foreign remittances received in india from your own bank account and such amounts will not be subject to tax in india as long as you are non resident one another area of active interest for the nra community is double tax awarded segment people live in countries like uk usa canada australia singapore each of these countries have got a tax treaty with india now the question that is being asked here is to claim the dtaa exemptions wherever it is applicable what is that the nras have to do and checklist to follow india has dtas with multiple countries and in the countries which you just mentioned most of them are jurisdictions where they are subject to taxes as a result they would sometimes end up with situations wherein they may be doubly taxed for the same amount of income so in such cases they can take the benefit of dta which is double tax avoidance agreement but one of the most basic prerequisites for this is the possession of a trc which is a tax residency certificate so you can apply for this trc with the tax authorities in the country of residence so it would be uk or us or singapore or wherever you are residing and on that basis you would be eligible for certain reliefs which in certain cases could be exclusions of that income or maybe a lower deduction on that income or a lower rate of tax on that income or could be a tax credit on such incomes these days one of the common questions thrown at us is that i never had an income in india but the income tax is throwing notices at me because i did not have an income i neglected it there are other people who say i replied a simple reply to the income tax department my first question to you is why these notices are coming and when the notices are received what are the do's and don'ts the nrs have to yes in many cases in the recent year or so we are seeing that lot of non residents have been receiving notices from the income tax department especially in cases wherein they have purchased properties in india and they have remitted that 1% tds as a result this property transaction is reflected in their form 26a now in such cases the minimum amount would be 50 lakhs because that is the minimum threshold limit prescribed for tds now the basic presumption of the income tax department would be that you have purchased the property worth 50 lakhs or more but you have not filed any tax return in india as a result they may be under the belief that there is income escaping their assessment as a result they may be issuing a notice and in such cases it is advisable to immediately respond to this and in case in most cases it is suggested that you can take the help of a professional as in many cases the nra may not be well versed with the indian tax laws and it is always advisable to seek professional help and uh, make sure that you file proper responses to the satisfaction of the tax officer or in some cases we have seen that replies which are not up to the satisfaction of the tax officers have resulted in orders being passed which again run into lakhs together and the again the further relief is still possible but it is a long process which involves appeals and in many cases deposits of taxes and in the absence of this it can even lead to attachment of your bank accounts so kindly be very careful in such cases and seek professional help wherever possible and it is always advisable that in case where you have purchased any property in that year even if you do not have any income source in india it is advisable to file your tax return so that there is no scrutiny picked up on this particular reason 
Oh, that's a very, very important uh, topic you touched upon. Another sensitive topic or uh, what people do on a regular basis is to maintain a joint bank. Nothing wrong in a joint bank. Husband and wife joint account, sometimes with the parents. Sometimes uh, they hold properties in the name of uh, joint names. They sell the property. Now, how the tax filing has to be done? What are the things people have to keep in mind when they hold the joint accounts? How the tax filing has to be done? This is a very common practice in many non-residents wherein one particular uh, person may be working and the other spouse may not be having any incomes in their hand. In such situations, they may be under the belief that it is sufficient if one of them files the tax returns. However, normally, when there is a joint account or property held in joint name, it is usually presumed that the income should be equally divided between both of them, which is arising from these joint accounts or joint properties. So as a result, it is always advisable to file both the tax returns of both the spouses or both the joint holders, whoever they may be, so that you do not face such issues with the department, wherein they may be under the assumption that property is being purchased by two persons, wherein one person may be having income, the other person may not be having an income as a result of which the second person may be getting a notice. So it is always advisable to file tax returns for both the people and if you are getting any incomes from these properties or any interest incomes or any other kind of incomes, always file the tax returns of both of them and you can declare them in both their names. One other uh, common problem reported to us is that I have filed my tax return, but while filing the tax return, there is an error. There is an inadvertent error. I overlooked certain data. I did not know. I forgot that. Once you file the tax return, is there an option where they can rectify the return? Yes, there are a few options and the most simplest option which is available is the filing of a revised return. Now, 31st of July is the due date for filing the original tax return. Now, in case there is some mistake or something which has been missed out, you can always file a revised tax return up to the 31st of December, which is the last date for filing a revised tax return. Now, up to this point in time, if there are any exclusions or if there are certain items which have escaped your notice, it is highly advisable to include them and file these revised tax returns so that you do not face any issues in the future. And these revised tax returns are equally valid and are considered by the income tax department. However, if there are any additional taxes which are to be paid, it is possible that certain interest may be levied and also certain late fees may come in. But it is still advisable to do this because in the absence of this, in the future, if the income tax department detects such incomes, they can levy penalties as well, in addition to the tax and interest. So it is advisable to do it at our end itself initially by filing a revised return and just pay any taxes or interest. One another common problem or common case is that I forgot to file the tax return by 31st of July or because of special circumstances due to which I am not able to file my tax return on 31st of July. I am away. I cannot reach out. I am ill. I am hospitalized. You can tell 100 different reasons. I missed to file the tax return by 31st of July. Can he come back and file the tax return? Related returns, is it possible? If yes, what costs are there and what is the procedure to follow? Yes, so 31st of July is the due date for filing the original tax return. Now, what happens if you have forgotten? Is it the end of the line? No, you still have certain options available. Now, the 31st of December deadline is still available for you to file a belated tax return. While filing a belated tax return, you may be still liable to pay some additional late fee or some additional interest. But still, you can still file these tax returns so that your incomes are declared and tomorrow there is no issue wherein you have not filed and penalties can be imposed on you. Additionally, what happens is, let's say I have forgotten to file even by this 31st of December or I'm unable to file by this 31st of December, then what happens? Now, beyond this as well, in the past it wasn't possible to file, but in recent years they have brought in a new concept called an updated tax return. In an updated tax return, you can file tax returns for two years prior to the year which we are referring to. For this, for example, in our current situation, we are filing the tax returns for 31st March 24. Now, if I have not filed for 31st March 23 or 31st March 22, I can still file an updated tax returns for these years. But there are certain conditions attached to it. Now, what happens in an updated tax return is I am supposed to pay an additional tax over and above my regular taxes. 
So for the immediate past year, I am supposed to pay 25% additional tax. And for the year even prior to that, I am supposed to pay 50% additional tax over and above my original tax obligations. Additionally, I may not be eligible to claim refunds in such cases. However, if there are very genuine cases like hospitalization or certain very grave circumstances, in such situations you are also uh, eligible to file a condonation before your tax commissioner and based on the genuinity of your documents, he can permit filing a refund based tax return as well. However, you will not be eligible for any interest on these refunds. Uh, Mr. Sanket Naik, there are a lot of people, NRAs, because their TDS is at a higher level, are entitled for a refund against the TDS made. If they have to claim the excess done TDS back, uh, what are the guidelines that they have to keep in mind? In most cases, NRIs do face this issue whether they are subject to higher rate of TDS. So what is required is that they have to file their tax returns by the original due date, if possible, that is the most uh, best advisable solution, then you can claim a refund. But let's say you do miss out on filing your original return, you can still file that belated return by 31st of December as well and still be eligible to claim that refund. Now, if you do miss out on this 31st of December, then it gets very difficult to claim this refund. So it's highly advisable to file by 31st July, which is the easiest situation, where there's no late fee as well. But beyond that, if you are missed out, Please do it by 31st December at least. Thank you, Sanket, for all these answers. Very crisp, very precise. And these are the problems which are haunting the NRA community. I'm very sure after your briefing, they have got answers for a lot of these questions that are there in mind. Uh, my dear viewers, again, requesting you, Sanket Naik and his spouse Pratiksha Pai, uh, both in Bangalore, are the upcoming dynamic chartered accountants. Please do subscribe to their Instagram page and the YouTube by name Fintelligent Investors. I have seen their pages very interesting. They keep discussing topics of uh, relevance for all of you. Please do subscribe. Uh, this is my personal request for all of you. Thank you, Sankit, for coming on the channel and giving answers to the common problems faced by the NRIs when it comes to question of filing the tax return. We remain in gratitude to you for your kindness to spare your time. I'm going to your busy schedule for the benefit of NRA community. Namaskar. Namaskar. Dear viewers, hope the video that I have done today helped you to understand if you are an NRA, should you file tax returns or there is no need to file the tax return? What are the things that you have to keep in mind? The tedious, how you can get back that money and the date ranges that you should be working on. If it helped you to understand all these answers, do not forget to give me a thumbs up. If you are a person who is yet to subscribe for this channel, please hit the subscribe button and press the bell icon. Do not forget to share these videos with your friends and relatives, dear and dear ones, and on all the WhatsApp groups on which you are connected with. Thank you very much for watching this episode on NRA Money Clinic. I shall be back with you next Tuesday with yet another interesting topic with yet another expert. Till then, stay safe. Jai Hind. Press the bell icon for more details and subscribe our channel.